institution. Uh, I'll take a little aside and mention that she also spent several years on the board of an institution which pays my paycheck every two weeks <laughs> and uh, kept them honest for some time. Uh, she has been board chairman of the Bethel Historical Society. She's worked on a number of committees and certainly has been a presence here from the very beginning of this organization's uh, revival. She knew the society founder, Eva Bean, who was the topic of tonight's presentation. She knew her well, and she'll share her knowledge of her and her work as a historian with us tonight as we honor Eva on the 30th anniversary of her death in 1969. And so without any further ado, <coughs> I'm pleased to present Margaret Joy Tibbetts. Well, I'm not the only one here, of course, who knew Eva Bean. Those of us who knew her and were privileged to call her a friend, we spent so much time talking among ourselves about her wonderful character, and it was truly wonderful, that sometimes I think we have neglected to appreciate her achievements. So perhaps it's just as well that we're devoting, I'm going to devote myself tonight more to her work as an historian than to her life. Though I'll sketch it, of course, to very briefly as we go along. As a historian, she, there were three major facets of her work, or two, I should say two major facets, and then one lesser one. The East Bethel Road, of course, was her, her major book, which was published in, 18, in 1959, and then uh, re-updated and published again by the Historical Society in 1984. There was her work on the history of Gould Academy, which is reflected, I should say, in uh, Frances Parkland's History of Gould Academy. And she's given generous credit throughout, but perhaps uh, she deserves more credit in a way than that which she received. She, uh, I think that the Dr. Parkman's work really depended upon her work, the first five or six chapters, more than one would think. And the last thing is she had an extensive collection of notes and preparatory work for other, other projects, which is, and this collection is upstairs in the Historical Society, and uh, I think it'll be valuable for as long as this organization lasts. She was born in East Bethel in 1895. She was born in the house which, uh, well, actually, my father owned it for a while, and he always, uh, my mother always called it the Jean Bean House. Her father was Eugene Bean. Uh, I think most of you know it as, as uh, the house which belonged to Mabel Abbott and Stephen, her brother, and then uh, Jim Mann's father, and I don't know who owns it now. It's just about a mile uh, this side of Bean's Corner. She lived in uh, East Bethel, of course, 1895, the date of her birth. She graduated from Gould Academy in 1913, and uh, during that first <coughs> period of her childhood, she, of course, absorbed probably every, uh, the experiences that we have before we're six years old are the most influential that we have in our life. And Eva, East Bethel was in her bones, her blood, everything about it, and she just, uh, she just knew it uh, so well, and uh, it comes through in every page of East Bethel Road. And then after she graduated from Gould, and she was very happy at Gould, she loved Gould wildly, almost. My father, the one joke he ever made in his life was when he said that he hoped nobody ever told Eva Bean there were other schools. <laughs> Eva laughed happily at that. She had a great sense of humor, much better than the doctor had, of course, but uh, even she could see that maybe now and then she went overboard on it. <laughs> then she went to graduate from Colby, 1917, I think it was, then she trained in New York at the Presbyterian Hospital in New York and took a RN degree as a nurse in 1922. And from 1922 until approximately 
1940. I don't know exactly when she came back. She worked in New York and <coughs> other places south of here. I don't. It's not worth identifying anything outside Maine, really, for her. <laughs> but she worked uh, mainly, I think, with private patients. In those days before uh, the World War II, there was no such thing as health insurance or any kind of a health program, and it was quite uh, common for frequently wealthy people, if they had a health problem or so in their family, would just have someone that stayed with them and lived with them all the time. They could afford it, and uh, they took them everywhere, and Eva was the uh, people who got Eva really got a prize, as they recognized, because she was very successful. She was, of course, meticulously professional, very uh, intelligent, well-educated, good company, and uh, she fitted in very well. I remember the first time I ever saw Eva, the only time I saw her in my trip, we had been in East Bethel. My father and mother used the farm, the, the uh, Jean Bean farm, for gardening, which is very basic in our family. I mean, it's import as important for any member of the Tibbetts family to have a garden as it is to breathe. And uh, so we had been down there, and we had been uh, visiting around the neighborhood, and uh, Eva and the Beans were having some kind of a celebration at the Mel Bean farm, which was up the road about half a mile or so, right across from the Fisk farm, which is then very, a cross old man named Mr. Dutton used to come stomping across the road and visit. Anyway, the beans were having, the food was very lavish. I associate East Bethel in my childhood with food, food, food. And uh, I remember Eva was about 32 or three at that time. She was uh, young and strong and slender and quick moving. And she had beautiful, beautiful red gold hair. All her life she had that beautiful hair, but it was very coppery and just just, just lovely. At, uh, and she was dining around. I think she brought us four or five different kinds of ice cream, which was a big hit. In those days, of course, ice cream had to be made with the freezer. And it was lovely stuff, but it wasn't as common as it is now, where you just go and buy it, because the ice cream that came from stores in those days wasn't very good. Anyway, we all had, and I remember Eva laughing, and they say, and moving very quickly and waiting on the, because the beans were quite old. Uh, Aunt Frank was probably the age I am now, but she seemed very old and tottering to me. <laughs> and uh, Eva, as I say, dashing around. That's the only memory I have of Eva and when, she, when she was perfectly healthy. Because sometime between <coughs> that period and about 1940, the rheumatoid arthritis, which uh, so bothered her all of her life, became more and more serious. In about 1940, she came back here. Stanley thinks it was a year or two earlier, uh, but it was about that time, and spent the rest of her life, the next 30 years, in Bethel. And as we both said, and we all remember, she was in very constant pain. Uh, more pain than my father said once than most people could ever realize. Uh, just to move, you could tell, the mother said when she saw Eva coming up street, mother washed the dishes and look out the window to, up on the main street, and Eva would be working her way up, and mother said she could tell what kind of a day it was by the way in which she moved. And she never complained, never. Every now and then she'd say, damn, hell, something like that, if her <laughs> ankle twinged or so forth. But she, she never really whined or complained, ever. And she never, never permitted herself really to despair. She just, she, she was too intelligent to think that there was any hope of a cure. Even, but she really knew that there was, there was no reason not to hope for other things. That you could enjoy life, you could do things, even though she was, as I say, so terribly crippled. And during the <coughs> next the 30 years that came on, she did any number of things. And from our purposes, the work on his histories was very, very important. She had very good sources, of course, for East Bethel Road. 
She had the best sources in the world because she'd been born and brought up there and she knew absolutely everybody in East Bethel. She was one of the few people who could understand how these families work. I'm born and brought up in Bethel and I could not possibly unravel the Bean family, for example. <laughs> I mean, I know when some stranger muffs up on which bean is which or something, but I can't sort it out. Well, the Bartlett's, the Bartlett's, the East Beth just look at the in East Bethel Road index on the Bartlett's, is terrifying. And that page up the page. But even at that, she also had, she went around and talked to everybody and she went through every gravestone and she went through all the papers and things which are not as good as the sources and she worked it out. And all of this was done, as I say, with great lameness. To say that she went into a cemetery, I watched her once when I was home on leave, I took my mother and Eva up to the cemetery in Mason Town, which is a very slight little hill you go up. And to watch her going up the hill, and then to get down on her hands and knees and read the gravestones and all of that sort of thing, you realized how very difficult it was for her. And of course it took much time, but she was very good and you look at her notes and you see how beautifully organized and methodical and this splendid handwriting. And uh, then when you think, remember that uh, even 40 or 50 years ago, how difficult it was or relatively difficult reproducing things. That is, Eva had to hire someone to type in and then go over the map, all of these things. Uh, Stanley and I were talking yesterday in another connection about uh, nowadays people do things on computers. Other people do things on computers. <laughs> computers that, uh, correct the manuscript right without thinking. And yet, I worked in the government in a fairly sophisticated era, and I can remember life and death struggles over the 15th carbon, could it be red, this kind of thing, going on and on. And yet, and then you multiply that with Eva's problems of working in a relatively isolated community. She really did an amazing amount of things, and she was doing other things all the time. Well, as I say, the three things that work are East Bethel Road is the most important. It's I would reckon, if anyone here does not have a copy and has any connection or interest in East Bethel, they should get one because it is terribly important in the history, but it has the important things. It has every house and every family over this area, which goes from down East Bethel Road down to as far as the line to Rumford Corner, I guess they call that area below Beans Corner, then from Beans Corner to Lock Mills, and then from Lock Mills back to Bethel, that triangle is covered very thoroughly on a house-by-house -house basis, first as it was in 1959, Eva did the groundwork, and then Stanley's update on it is very interesting too, because the families, the Historical Society really did a wonderful thing here, 1984, bringing every family up to date. Because between 1959 and 1984, it's surprising <coughs> how the families changed and some of the families' uh, observations on it. For example, in 1959, practically no one on East Bethel Road had ever been divorced. In 1984, there were very few families that they didn't have some family, somebody in it somewhere who had been divorced. That's something that you might not pick up except as a historian as you look at it. But she goes, as I say, from house to house and looking through, going, as I say, from house to house, and you realize how very old some of these families are by American terms, of course, which is old. But East Bethel Road basically was settled by people who came there right after the revolution. You could pick it up from the houses, uh, I think you pick it up, say, at the Stanley House, where Benjamin Russell was, came up with General Amos Hastings, right fresh from the revolution, and you go right down through. And there you see why it is such an interesting community, because there aren't too many looking at the United States as a whole, the number of families which are living in the same house 
or in the same piece of land that their ancestors were living on in the 18th century is a distinct minority. Mm -hmm. Upper New England, or all of New England, as a matter of fact, parts of the south, or just the fringes have a few. And East Bethel Road has a, East Bethel has a number of families which really date from the 18th century. And they're very large, some of these families, very important in local terms, not only in East Bethel, but in the town of Bethel as a whole. And Eva has it there. And she also has all of the families, other families too. There's nothing disgraceful in not being there in the 18th century, and the people who come in. There, I think, Eva has, the t in the tone of her book, has it all of a Mr. L Dr. Lapham. I mean, I recognize Dr. Lapham's very useful and all that sort of thing because he copied what Dr. Crew did and passed it on to the rest of us. <laughs> so that's how we get the best things from the Bethel history. <laughs> but, because uh, I think Dr. True was much more interesting. But then, but Eva, Eva covered everybody much more. And uh, one of the irritating things about the Bethel history to me is that though some families are beautifully covered, there are other families around Bethel which are very old, which aren't mentioned at all. And the fact is they just, well, they weren't members of Mr. Lapp or Dr. Lapham's social set, so to speak. <laughs> But Ava is a, and as it comes through, it's not a, East Bethel Road is not a straight narrative history. I mean, it doesn't have a beginning, a middle, and an end. She has the a chapter on the churches, a chapter on the schools, and she covers the hills, which are very women important, to, or were important in the 19th century. And when uh, I was a little girl in the 1920s, there were still people who lived up on some of those hills. And uh, my father used to have to go up to treat them, and it was always a, a great thing uh, But uh, uh, to go up, for example, where the abbot Stephen and Mabel Abbott used to live up on that hill. And they had a terrific orchard, and uh, Mabel had a lovely rose outside the front door. And uh, also an absolutely tremendous view, with the view from the bucks here, uh, where the bucks live. What is that, Swan Hill? Swan Hill, Swan Hill. that was all of these things. And she covered the hills. Of course, the hills, after the 1920s, the automobile and the roads and one thing to another, the people began to move down. But it was a loss, uh, for, in a way, because that was part of a, as long as the horse had to do the work and people could live up there, it was part of the way in which rural Maine and uh, rural New England, I suppose, New Hampshire and Vermont have much the same way, part of the life there. The, as social history, and as I say, uh, it's not a straight narrative story that just begins. Eva plunges right in after these introductory chapters on where Bethel is and foundings of Bethel and then sort of beginning with it. The, the, she plunges right in on the beginning from house to house and goes through. But reading it through, as I say, it becomes more and more interesting and me. And she puts sometimes anecdotes in, sometimes she puts it in on the, the families, or sometimes she puts it in uh, with the uh, people concerned, uh, with the houses and the lots concerned. Uh, people, there are certain families and people, characters who appeal to her. In her own family, she talks quite often about Uncle Ned Bean, her feelings seemed to be mixed. Apparently he was something what she would call convivial, which is a polite way of saying he drank too much. <laughs> I learned that in the State Department when you read efficiency reports and you say things like, his wife is great at parties, that set up a warning. <laughs> but when it said convivial, as I say that, well, Eva uses it the same way. But since, it, since it's her own family, she apparently feels free to mention it, him by name. And she says, Uncle Ned Bean used to spend a good deal of his time wandering around inspecting other, supervising other people's work, as she put it, and looking at their gardens and their houses. And his report on the house and the garden and his whole family would depend on whether or not they offered him something to drink. Because if he came home and he had a drink, he'd say, oh, great, you know, wonderful young couple, going far, children doing fine, wonderful place, great shape. But if they didn't 
shell out with anything. He came through and said, I don't know what's going to happen to that man. going downhill. Well, she puts in that sort of thing, or else she puts in other bits of history. The, I was interested, the, down below the house for by the Jean Bean house where my parents gardened, and so about uh, two, uh, two houses down, I would say, uh, was a very large farm, which Marge, uh, which, uh, a house which Maude Danforth had, I guess, in uh, recent years, but when I was uh, in East, East Bethel going back and forth there, uh, the, it was the Port of Fowl. And I've heard over the years many people speak of how Port of Fowl was one of the very best, very best farmers around, and it was a tremendous place. Incidentally, I discovered reading Ebers, it was he really had been the host, his wife's place, when Port of Fowl had come in as the son-in-law. And his, his, uh, anyway, the Port of Fowl, well, Eva describes it, she's talking of Port of Fowl's place, and what a fine place it was, and she said they had a dog-operated milk separator. I think that what she meant was the dog provided the power of running, of running the separator. But anyway, you could see what the impression that would make of a child. I mean, how could you keep them out of the place if the dog was separate from running? <laughs> anyway, what she was describing, she said, Port of Fowl used to go once a week at least to Rumford in the summer season with a truck, uh, wagon load of vegetables, which he sold from door to door. And he had a great number of customers. This was before the days of supermarkets and so forth. And she said he had to get up at 3 in the morning to begin washing and sorting and so forth. The, the vegetables had to be picked the night before and then, as I say, washed and fixed up. And then uh, he, they'd leave between 5.30 and 6 so, to get on to rump. But I don't know how long it would take at that time. There were a couple of hours or so at least for the... I always get lost below Rumford Corner, so I never take that road, but anyway, there would be uh, uh, taken. Anyway, he'd get once, and then when he got to Rumford, he had a large number of places he went. And um, Rumford, as you know, has these three-decker tenement houses. And he had to walk up the stairs with every one. Vegetables, carrying the vegetables from door to door, as they say, to get the, and vegetables can be fairly heavy if you have potatoes and corn and beets and that sort of thing. Uh, and uh, all, and walk up and then walk up and down, walk up and down, and so forth. It would take a considerable part of the day, it would be probably early afternoon before he was through. And this was a great deal of work. Then he had to come home, unload the wagon, and get around and do all his chores for supper. And one thing, another. The point of this to me was it was the first time that I'd heard all these years about Port of Fowl and the Great Farm and one thing or another. I hadn't realized exactly how much work it was. These people in East Bethel <coughs> and these beautiful big farms were workers. And you see that. Uh, and it was and it was very, we're not talking about the South, you see, where people had vast plantations with somebody else doing the work. We're not talking about the British landed aristocracy. The great, big, wonderful farms, and they were wonderful in East Bethel because the intervales and so forth, all of them, these were working, working people. And Eva gives them full credit for that, but they also had a good de deal of fun, as she brings out, as to say, with various uh, old odds and ends and little jokes and things. She and, you know, in a small community before the days of television, before the days of radio, where people visited around, anecdotes and stories and things became absolutely solidified into per memory for per perpetuity. And she'll talk about the, somebody, I think it was a Deacon Kimball who was building an under, underpass from one field to the next and he was trying to get a team of oxen through. And it was, the underpass was rather small and man standing by says, I'll bet you ten dollars you don't get them oxen through there. And he said, I'll take you up on it. Promptly took the oxen out of the yoke, put them one by one, and, then <laughs> and the man had to pay him ten dollars. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's so 
something that had a great impression on the neighborhood and it would go around. And then there would be various jokes on people. Eva's talking about another man whom she described as convivial, going along the road, and just below the Stanleys, there's the little, tiny little brook that goes under the road, and uh, he had sort of uh, fallen asleep, and somebody came along while he was going by that area and took the horse out of the buggy, and the horse, of course, went on home. <laughs> but the people came along and saw the old man sitting there in the sunshine, sleeping it off, and they said, how are you getting on? I'm making any progress, Uncle Al? And he said, oh, I'm jogging along all right. You know, <laughs> in every neighborhood, there's always a comedian, and there's always, of course, a bunch of young boys or men or something who fought to pranks, whether it's changing the pies at the grain supper or something like that. You know. And uh, Eva catches that spirit. There were grain suppers, which were great fun, and there were school entertainments, and then there were various things and all. And she, and she puts it in. Sometimes she has odds and ends, or sometimes she just puts in uh, anecdotes or jokes or local sayings, most of which were unintelligible to me. Uh, but, uh, but, or sometimes, she does, at one point, she just uh, quoted from an old geography book she had, which was uh, interested her, and it interested me, because she said that, uh, gives you some background, it was against which this people were living. In 1791, of 1,000 people living, 23 would die at birth. 277 would die soon after, more or less, from worms, cutting teeth, or various other childhood illnesses. 80 would have the smallpox. Seven would die of measles. Eight women would die in childbirth. 191 would die of consumption. 150 would die of fever. Uh, and then there'd be 12 would be some disaster and so forth. Anyway, out of 1,000 people, 211 people would live to an advanced old age. <laughs> well, if you look at that, I, I don't have any idea whether the statistics uh, are reliable, but, but they must have been reliable at the time. And uh, it gives you some idea of the fact that uh, even up until the early years of this century, there were some things with uh, people were fear, feared, which uh, country people were subject, subject to, as well as city people, and uh, that uh, life was, was much harder from the standpoint of health in some respects, although we do complain about our health all the time, all the time, spend enormous amounts of money on it, that's right. She, uh, as I say, she goes on, she gives very good social history, social <coughs> history, and social history is very important how people live, how they made their living, how they got along, how they organized themselves. All of this comes through. It gives the impression of a community which was very close-knit, understood each other very well, and probably took pretty good care of each other in a very unpretentious way, though some of them, of course, were less idealist citizens than others. Uh, there were very important families, very important uh, both from the standpoint of money and education and, uh, well, but they were part of the community, they were just as close and they knew each other as well as if they were not, uh, as if they had not been. This is, of course, almost uniquely American, and in America, very strong in New England, because in the European system, the well-to-do people in the country had nothing to do with the less well-to-do except to employ them as peasants, or t tenants or something. We do not have peasants in this country, and one of the reasons is the communities like that. And East Bethel, of all the communities uh, around, is very, I think is particularly clannish in the sense that East Bethel people uh, know each other and respect each other and uh, defend the situation, defend their institutions and habits and all. They happen to be, of course, one of the better farming area, in fact, the very best farming area probably in this uh, section of the, certainly in, Be in, the Be in Bethel, with those great 
beautiful indigo lands. Uh, they were also a very hard working area. They remained more agriculturally oriented, uh, certainly up in, e in Eva's period, the end of the 19th century, for the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, lumber is there, but it's in the background. And uh, as I think I wrote in the preface to the 1984 edition, it's one of the best things, East Bethel Road is still there are no fast food joints or filling stations or anything like that. And I find that, well, it really is. It's one of the loveliest places, I think. Uh, to drive up the river is uh, one of the very best things. And uh, you have a lot of new houses, some of which are very interesting looking and uh, some of which less so. But you also have, at regular intervals, a lot of very fine old houses. And they look they're old, but the best thing about them is they're lived in and used. Uh, my nephew was saying one day, Barry, who was the antique dealer, was saying one day that the, he said, you know, all the up and down East Bethel Road, they have some of the finest country antiques in Maine, probably some of the finest country antiques in, in uh, New England. He said, but nobody can complain about it. He said, because the best thing is for an antique is to be used. It's part of, it's in the family and it's there. And uh, it's much better than just museums are a good second choice. And the worst choice, worst thing to do is to sell it to somebody in Texas who wants to pretend he has a, a long family history in this section. <laughs> And that's the way, it, well it is, as I say, all of this I think comes through in uh, Eva's book. And I say, if you have any uh, East Bethel connections, or even if you have any interest in what life was like in Bethel, if you read it, uh, I would uh, urge you to get one. Particularly if you have any family connections, because uh, one of the things you, when these books are, when the Historical Society was republishing these books was that, you were worn out with people, before they were republished, worn out with people asking you if you could get a copy of this, a copy of that, because I want to find out about uh, my ancestors. History in America gets lost very quickly, and you know, people's memories are short, and uh, it's, uh, if you ever do any teaching, it's uh, shattered me when I was teaching at the uh, Bowdoin in the 1970s, was that some of these, uh, young people from good upper class, upper middle class homes had very little conception really of events in American history uh, such, such as the McCarthy period which had taken place 20 years earlier. If you've lived through the 20th century, it's depressing when you find someone, some kid who doesn't really know when John F. Kennedy was assassinated. If you said 1865, he'd probably say that was it. <laughs> because, so, but people don't, okay, so if you have any family connections that, uh, in East Bethel, I would recommend getting a copy of the book, because someday your grandchildren and so forth might like to write a term paper or might like to know about it. Now let's look at Eva's book, Eva's contribution on Gould Academy. And Gould, there is a good history of Gould Academy written by Francis Parkman, who is a very nice, very nice, very good fellow indeed, very pleasant man. He was hired by Gould to write it. He's a grandson or great-grandson, I don't know which, of the Francis Parkman, who was one of the great American historians of the early 19th century. Eva had been for many years alumni secretary, and she had worked and written a draft on the history of Gould Academy, which goes from 1836 and the founding to 1961. Uh, and then when <coughs> Gould, uh, she had been working up at, in the library at the academy and up in the third floor of the academy, I, where there are Doc, where Dr. Crew's collection of things. And then when Gould transformed itself in the late 1960s, I wasn't around, but I'm told that many of you will remember the first 
new headmaster was someone named Mr. Scheibler. And uh, he left word at the desk one day that people from the town were not to go up in there, and that included Eva. Mm -hmm. And uh, my mother said it's one of the few times she ever saw Eva Detroit distressed, but anyway, but not not to lose control, but just anyway, she said, blanky blank. <laughs> and, uh, but she had a, written a manuscript which was has been in, typed up and <coughs> reproduced in what psycho style or something like that. And I think there are two or three copies. So I haven't uh, do not have a copy, but I read it in extenso because when Mr. Park, Dr. Parkman was assigned to write the history, <coughs> he's a fine fellow, but he wasn't born and brought up in Bethel, Maine and really had trouble finding us, I think, when he came. And it had to be someone on the trustees, and I was delegated to be the one to tell him, to bring him in. And it's like many experiences I've had in my life with you hire a consultant to come in and fix you up, and then the local people wear themselves out for the next year or two sitting around briefing the consultant on what he's supposed to be looking for. Well, I found myself in here, he was both and he appreciated immediately that Eva had done a very good job. And in fact, he was somewhat embarrassed because what she was born and brought up here. She went to the academy here. She knew Mr. Hanscom, the great headmaster, and so forth. She knew him better than I did because uh, I was went to Mr. Hanscom, but it was in the last four years, three or four years of his tenure, and Eva was there right in his prime when he was in his most active stage or something. But he, he did his job, and but he inevitably grew very heavily upon her work. Sometimes he padded it out by going around to Massachusetts, the early days of Bethel and so forth, it all coincide when we were still under, the, Maine was under the control of Massachusetts. So he'd find things in various Massachusetts libraries about things. And he reported with great uh, pleasure that he had discovered that Har both Harvard University Library and the Athenaeum Library, which is a you know, very elite library in Boston a Circle, had copies of East Bethel Road, that they had bought them before he'd ever heard of Bethel. And I think that just shows that Harvard knows, the, knows its business because it is an excellent local history. Bowdoin College also has East Bethel Road. I discovered that when I was uh, working there. And it has a number of other town histories, but uh, not, not too many from inland. They just have a lot of the area right around Topsom and so forth uh, from the coast, as well as, uh, of course, Portland's up this way. So if you... <coughs> If you go through Mr. Parkman's appendices at the back of the book, you will see that he pays generous tribute, says, I drew very heavily on this bean here and there and there and here. Uh, I, there is not, in his book, there is not one substantive difference. He had no, absolutely no quarrel with anything Eva wrote or her analyses <coughs> of things. Uh, not that the history of Gould Academy is that interesting or that dramatic it was founded, and then there was the business with uh, Daniel Gould, then there was Dr. True rescued it, and uh, then uh, after Dr. True was fired by the trustees in an uncharacteristically stupid move, because trustees are usually pretty good, I think, in some ways. They may not do the right thing, but they know it. They know the right thing. <laughs> uh, and, uh, uh, then, as I say, it's a fairly dull history. But, uh, and uh, the only thing he did, he well, he found more trouble, more fault with me than with Eva on the question of Daniel Gould. He he thought we were both particularly hard on a Harvard man who came up here to civilize the natives, so to speak. <laughs> and, uh, as you know, the natives. One of my favorite things I've quoted it often is that uh, in the local petition against the Daniel Gould, where the people in the church, they uh, said that we may be back in the country, but we deserve better than this. <laughs> and uh, I thought that was, you know, they were very tough nuts, the original founders of Bethel. They were some of the toughest <coughs> nuts you'll ever meet, I think. But anyway, she did, it's a very fine straight. And although she did, 
She didn't write a straight narrative history for East Bethel Road, for example. She had all this book. But she demonstrated in Gould Academy that if she had wanted to, to go good. But I think East Bethel Road is much better the way she did it. It's a house, it's houses and families and details and anecdotes and oh, she includes a lot of other stuff like <coughs> old wills and testaments and deeds and so forth and that business, as I say. And I think that her work in the Gould history deserves, it gets generous tribute, but I think it really deserves more than that. I think it is more than just something on which you could draw and work on. I think she really made the underpinning, the foundation is there. And any historian, not just Dr. Parkman working on it, would have found that it had a good solid base on which he could, could, it could add or subtract details and all. And what Finally, on Eva's notes, uh, she was Working, Stanley tells me, that uh, on, uh, she hoped to work when she was through on a history of Oxford County. And this just shows her indomitable courage because uh, Oxford County, it's, uh, it's, we're a very large and varied, that is, northern Oxford <coughs> County is very di different from southern Oxford County. There's a world of difference between something like Upton or uh, Freiburg, essentially, and they're all, yep, they're all in Oxford County. And Eva's approach on to getting into the skin, of, under the skin of a town, so to speak, depended on knowing a great deal about people and about the really knowing and getting things sorted out that way. And that would have been terribly hard uh, for her working around in to do the county as a whole. Rumford, for example, is a complete, and Rumford, Mexico, a completely different story from the, much of the rest of Oxford County, and that would have been difficult. What she has in the notes that I looked through hastily the other day, she would made a good beginning on Greenwood, of course, which is right next door. In fact, in East Bethel Road, she lists part of the Gore Road and covers it to, in looking at the maps and things, and I think the Gore Road is actually in Lock Mill, is in Greenwood. So and uh, she had families and things too. And uh, the same technique of working with her friends. Among Eva's the notes, it's fascinating. You keep finding postcards answering questions. Yes, Aunt so and so was such and such and so forth. Yes, we did this and that, or after the fire. And all that. One of the things that impresses you is uh, Eva's, when you go through, the, through an area, and the landscape's been altered by fires and people moving and doing this and that. Her touch is absolutely sure, because up and down East Bethel, it's no trouble to say that right around uh, the uh, Middle Interval Church, there used to be this, there used to be that, and there isn't a trace of them there now. Uh, because she knows, she remembers when she was a little girl, probably drove by and you could still see the foundations parts of them. Uh, but anyway, she was beginning on that, and she has a notebook, Fairly good sized book, very full of notes on families and beginnings and so forth. She has the beginnings of that on Newry and Albany. And uh, I hope someday, uh, Newry. Newry has had uh, been written up. I hope some, uh, Paula White did it some years ago, but I hope someday someone, some eager student, someone with a certain amount of enthusiasm <coughs> and interest in it, does use Eva's work and finish it, she'll have a tough time because the sources that Eva had are much better because uh, people who remember her now are dying off. They don't die at an unusual rate. There's nothing suspicious about it. But they don't. <laughs> <laughs> and, as it goes, and the uh, sources, as a, and uh, I've nagged Stanley for years off and on about the, pretty soon the 20th century, you know. Here we are, Stanley, but take us quickly. <laughs> <laughs> and along with there are a lot of other things, but she's also saved all sorts of other things which caught her imagination. She's gone through all of the papers and the clippings, the Oxford Democrat and then the Advertiser and all these various things. 
and uh, which catch her imagination and which uh, or just appeal to her interest in. I like the item that said the Reverend Eliphaz Chapman had driven a two-horse team straight through. He'd come up from southern New Hampshire and <coughs> come via Bridgeton and Albany. From Albany to Bethel, there was no road at all. Now, how would you like to drive a two-horse team through an area with no road? That, that would be a challenge, it? particularly since it must have been rather swampy and thick, as I say. But uh, he made it and, uh, uh, at a surprisingly good rate of speed. Well, to summarize, she's a local historian, yes. And she does a supremely good job on an important local area. And local histories, of course, are very basic because to write overviews and big histories, you have to be able to know what was going on down below. This the comparison is used often, but it's like the jigsaw puzzle. Put the bits and pieces in. Sometimes some pieces can be very, very important. She was not just an antiquarian, an antiquarian is someone who collects all sorts of things, old things, and puts, keeps them around, and they're useful to historians. But she's not just that. Eva knew what she was doing. She was, uh, had a good, strong, keen mind, educated mind, and she could look and see. She could have characterized East Bethel in two or three sentences and done it <coughs> by email. She preferred to do, to put the details in. And that's the way it is, because anybody, anybody who reads it can see what it's, it's like, as I say. Uh, she used the sources in an ideal way, and she didn't neglect anybody. And that's the way I think one of the things that we've all learned is that you mustn't neglect anyone's point of view, because you can get it all, and I think uh, get it uh, a well-rounded picture. That's one of my complaints about uh, Dr. Lapham, is he spends so much of his time focusing on some of the well to prosperous businessmen around town, and they all sound just alike uh, by the time he's finished writing them. So, and there were other things happening around town which might have been more interesting. Well, certainly some of the things that have come out in many of our meetings. The meeting we had when they described how the Bethel water system was built for all these the Italians they had to import from Massachusetts to do the dirty job of getting in under the river and doing the actual work. I thought was much more interesting than reading about somebody like Pinckney Burnham donating $50 for the opening <laughs> challenge or something like that. But, uh, but as I say, she <coughs> reflects the uh, community exactly as it was. She happened to have a particularly interesting area that is, I think it's interesting because I was enjoyed these people. I look back on uh, those days <coughs> coming up and down, going to the farm, and the, the pleasures you take of the first green corn or the new potatoes or that sort of thing, or picking berries or doing all this business, or, or struggling, my father struggling with the light of the lantern to take the porcupine quills out of somebody's dog that did happen to them. And the old couple that lived next to the, to the bean farm right over the gully, there was the Bill Bartlett's, uh, Aunt Fanny and Uncle Bill, we called them. Aunt Fanny was very small, and Uncle Bill was rather solid. And uh, don't ask me what his role was in the Bartlett mayor structure, but it was, a, they were very, it was an old family, and it was a beautiful farm. Just looking out over the intervals, there was a beautiful, a beautiful interval uh, behind, always, down over the hill, and those big elm trees. It makes me very sentimental. <laughs> and uh, Eva was very, very much, that was her life, and she had loved it, and she'd done other things. She'd gone and traveled, and she'd never neglected, I mean, practically to the end of her life, she was still asking Monique to come in so that they could talk in French because she didn't want to forget French. As they, and uh, she was perfectly wonderful about that as a, a remarkable person, but uh, also remarkable works. Thanks very much. <laughs> Thank you very much.
We're not finished, though. <laughs> this is on. Well, it's, this is a very interesting time of year, and uh, I had a special thing I was going to make for tonight because it's April 1st, but I didn't. One reason is that I found out that rhubarb was $4 for a little package, and that was too much. So, so I think the next meeting we're going to have pool. And the pool came from England, and uh, I'm sorry that I couldn't make it, but I will for the next meeting. And we are going to have a couple of things, though, because, of course, you know, hot cross buns, so I've got some hot cross buns for you. And also, there's one thing that everybody in the whole world eats. Anybody know? Eggs. Eggs. <laughs> and uh, so we've got some eggs. And you know that they, that the interesting thing about eggs was that at one time, the in the Lenten season, that they weren't supposed to eat any eggs until until Good Friday and Easter, you know, and so that was why eggs were so special. And I won't tell you the story about why we have a rabbit, because the, the rabbit was the one that they went out, you know, playing in the woods, and uh, and the children were looking for eggs and having fun, and all of a sudden the rabbit came hopping out, and they said, hey, the rabbit's eggs, so the, the rabbit's eggs, and so that's why we have rabbits at Easter. <laughs> 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 And of course, Easter was a very special day for people in England because they, they were given permission to go see their mothers. And one of the things that they did was to take a cake to their mothers, and Sylvia's made a wonderful cake for you. <laughs> this program at the Bethel Historical Society has been recorded by Natalie Timberlake for use in Channel 4 and for the archives of the Historical Society. Thank you. Well, I'm good. How are you? Watch out for the floor in there. All set? Well, I've discovered what one of the messages is. What? Well, look in there and see. Have you turned, are you still recording? I am.